we're going to talk about arbitrage pricing theory. Uh, arbitrage pricing theory is based on these factor models. And so the first thing I'll do is say, well, what's a factor model? This is a linear factor model. Okay. Now it comes from the fact that these are factors commonly denoted as F sub one, F sub two, and it is a linear combination that is modeling the returns of some asset. So R sub I is a return stream and you're saying, can I predict for returns uh, using these factors? Another way to phrase it is um, what percentage of my returns, what portion of my returns comes from each of these factors? Right? Because you can think about returns as coming from different places. So you might have an algorithm that has, gets a lot of its returns from the market, and that's not necessarily great. You might have an algorithm that gets a lot of its returns from small cap stocks. I mean, maybe that's okay. Again, it all depends on your risk tolerances, uh, what you know, type of strategy you're trying to achieve. So, And then the final way to think about it is how exposed am I to these factors? Right, so there's the kind of three different modes of thinking here. You're saying, can I use these factors to predict my returns? What percentage of my returns are coming from these factors? And how exposed am I to the uh, am I to these factors? They're all very important, and we're going to talk about all three of those modes of thinking today. So, arbitrage pricing theory uh, basically says that um, assets should be correctly priced based on the expected returns and the risk that you're taking on. Now, factors are a good expression of risk, as we'll talk about more in the um, risk analysis portion of the lecture. But the reason for that is because if you have a lot of your returns coming from one factor, your returns are very dependent on that factor. And that factor going down or up, as it may be whether you're shorted or along that factor, uh, can negatively impact you a lot. So you would say that there is you're taking out risk on that factor when you're when you're when your return streams come from that factor. So um, what arbitrage pricing theory says is it says that basically this formula will always hold. This formula of the expected returns is equal to the risk-free rate. And again, in case you don't remember, the risk-free rate is um, basically this the perfectly safe way to invest your money. And for most people use US Treasury bonds to do this. They don't give very much returns, but they're guaranteed. They're not going to default on you. They're not going to go down. So that's the risk-free rate. And you're saying in, in order, like the risk-free rate is the perfectly safe way. And to get any returns over the risk-free rate, you have to take on some risk. And this is kind of a fundamental theory in finance is that there's kind of no free lunch, right? And in a perfectly efficient market, um, you would not be able to get more returns without taking on more risk. Because, and and the, expected, the expected value after a certain amount of time would be the same for any asset because if there was an asset that could get more returns than the risk it took on, um, that asset would be immediately bought down to the point where it was no longer, like it, it got too expensive basically. So arbitrage says that whenever something is mispriced, whenever something is more profitable than the risk it takes on, or whenever something is too, not as profitable as the risk it takes on, um, that asset will be arbitraged back down to this fair uh, rate. So what does that mean? Well, that's all well and good uh, if you know the expected returns of an asset. But of course, knowing the expected returns is incredibly difficult and more or less impossible. So what this is telling you is it's saying, if I know this thing, which is impossible to know, then I can say all this fancy stuff, right? But you don't know that thing. So what do you do? Well, the interesting thing is you can go the other direction. You can say, let's say I don't know expected returns, but I theorize that the markets are obeying this uh, this arbitrage rule, that prices are going to be arbitraged out. Okay, well, what that means is, if you know the risk-free rate and you know all of these factors, which you do, then you can predict for expected returns, right? So this is super valuable because it means that it gives you a way to predict for returns 
based on these factors. And what this leads to is um, basically these long short equity strategies. And we're going to do a full lecture on long short equity strategies. So I'm not going to, going to go into it a huge amount here. But the general idea is that for every asset that you have on the stock market, like every, every one of like the approximately 10,000 assets, you equities rather, sorry, you um, price the equity based on these factors. And these factors can be whatever. They can be the FAMA French factors, which I'll talk about a little later. They can be some factors that you've developed, which is kind of the interesting case. Um, oftentimes, you'll probably want to use fundamental factors for this. And I'll talk about fundamental factor modeling um, a little later. But the general idea is that you predict for the expected returns given these factors, and then you rank everything by those expected returns. And what you're betting on is not betting on being able to perfectly predict returns for any one given asset. You're betting on the fact that in that ranking, the uh, assets, the equities near the top of the ranking will have higher returns than the assets near the bottom of that ranking. And the reason that that works out is because um, let's say that you have assets at the top tending to make 5% more per year than the market and assets at the bottom tending to make 5% less. Okay, great. You've, you've differentiated your, your assets. This ranking system you've developed is predictive. And we've talked about how to check the predictivity of a ranking system in the Spearman uh, rank correlation lecture. Uh, so I recommend you go check that out if you're considering developing a long short equity strategy which you should do, um, but it, it boils down to this formula, which is at the top basket, let's say you long the top ones that you think will make more, and then that the returns you can expect from those are market plus 5%, and then you short the bottom basket, like 10%, and then, sorry, you short like, you know, the bottom, let's say 1,000 stocks, long the bottom, long the top 1,000 stocks, you short the bottom 1,000 stocks, and that means the returns you're gonna get on that is market minus 5%, but it's negative because you've shorted it. Markets cancel out, so you get market neutrality, and you should get a consistent 10%. So you're making a pure bet on the quality of your factor model using a long short equity strategy. And you don't get dependent on the market, you become market neutral. Um, I think they're really great strategies, and they allow you to focus on modeling the market using fundamental factors, uh, which in my opinion is one of the best ways to model the market because fundamental factors are like real things that are going on at companies, right? If I tell you, hey, um, a company has a lot of cash and not very much debt. On average, that company is probably going to do better than a company that has a lot of debt and not very much cash. That's kind of like a, you know, very accessible, tangible statement. It's not vulnerable to a lot of bias. And so modeling the markets in those ways um, tend to be much more reliable than doing something, you know, crazy with maybe a single instrument strategy or trying to machine learn price curves or something like that. So we're going to show an example of this, as we always do. Um, and uh, what we're going to do is we're going to compute expected returns for two assets. And in this case, the factors we're going to use are going to be the market, SPY, uh, and the market returns, rather. Sorry, we're getting, using the SPY ETF as a proxy for market returns. And then the, the risk-free rate, we're going to use this ETF as a proxy for that. It's not perfect, but it's fine for a teaching example. Um, so what we're going to do is just create our data set and then we'll run our regression and we'll say, give me the coefficients in this factor model, modeling the asset returns as a linear combination of market returns and the risk-free rate returns. Okay. So these are the coefficients you get. You say for the first asset, which is this HSC guy, I have no idea what that is. Um, for the first asset, you say, uh, P-value on that asset, less than 0 0.05, great. So we actually can trust these coefficients. They seem to be predictive. And the market, beta, beta to the market, which is the beta that you always hear people talking about. You say strategies beta is 0.7, strategies beta is 1.5. They mean beta to the market, unless they specify otherwise. It's just slang. But of course, there's a beta to everything, as you see in this factor model. So the beta to the market um, is 1.76. What does that mean? Well, it means we're leveraged on the market. It means when the market goes up, we go up 1.7 times as much. When the market goes down, we go down 1.7 times as much with this security, more volatile than the market. And then the risk-free rate, we actually have a huge beta to the risk-free rate. We have a negative, negative 8.5. Why is that? Well, the risk-free rate is a lot smaller than the market. 
So this model has to, like the market returns, the returns on the risk rate are tiny. So this model has to put a massive coefficient on them to normalize them up. Um, maybe it would make sense in this case to uh, make a z-score out of these returns rather than just taking the raw returns because you can lead to like weird things in your model like this where one coefficient will just be way bigger than another. Um, so definitely normalizing your factors, and we'll, we'll talk about that in, in the next notebook, is, is useful. Uh, but if you don't, you can get to some weird situations like this. Now, some of you might know what's coming next here, which is we've just done a static regression on the time period of, uh, what is it here? It looks like, looks like a, a decent time period, um, about a year. So we've just done a static regression on about a year. And the, oh, the other thing I'm going to point out here is that this isn't a perfect way to do it, but it's fine, again, for a teaching example. The way that we're making this model predictive is we're looking for returns a month in the future. Okay, so we've offset the prices, we've offset the returns of the assets and not of the um, factors. So we're saying, do the factors predict for returns a month one ahead rather than do the factors predict for returns today? And this is not technically correct because the returns on the day a month ahead are not um, just that day's returns, they're the cumulative returns over those 30 days. So if you wanted to actually you know, make a predictive model, you'd want to change this a little bit. Um, but it's, it, gets, it gets fairly complicated quickly in terms of the math. Not fairly complicated, I don't want to scare anybody away, but like, it gets complicated enough that I didn't want to do it for this teaching example. So what we're asking here is, do the returns precisely 30 days in the future, um, are they predicted for by these two factors today? So uh, as you can see, this model would say that they are because the p-values are under 0 0.05 for both of them. And um, But of course, like I always say, you cannot just look at these, one, these single values. You just cannot take enough information out of one regression run on all your data. You need to look at different parts of your data. What happens if you run the regression over time? Because time moves, right? So like we were running the regression, let's say on this date, but you know, a month from now, we're running it on this date and we're gonna get different answers. And we wanna know, is my answer gonna be predictive? Because that's the question that you're really asking. You're saying, okay, in the past, these factors have been predictive of the month forward returns on the asset, but will that behavior hold true, right? Are the, are the factored values today predictive of returns a month from today, which we don't know yet, right? And to answer that question, you have to look at how consistent your model is being. Well, you can see here that, and again, probably for the reason that I mentioned that the risk-free rate returns are tiny, this thing is crazy inconsistent. The beta to the risk-free rate is just going all over the place. And look, if you just this is the static value from the regression of negative eight, around negative eight. And if you had just done that one regression, you would have ignored all of this crazy stuff that's happening in here, right? So like you, you can't just do a single regression. You need to look at what happens over time. And as you can see in this model, you'd say like, uh, maybe I don't want to use this model to predict for my returns because this is pretty inconsistent. And this is fine because again, we're predicting for the returns of one asset. This is actually not going to give us very interesting results because single assets tend to be pretty arbitraged. So no one asset is like some crazy, you know, returns product that you can do crazy stuff with, right? Because if it were, it's a freely traded asset. Anybody can efficiently buy it out. If an asset is suddenly getting better returns in the market, it has positive alpha, it'll immediately get arbitraged down. Right? The reason that active managers can avoid that is because their product is not freely traded on the market. Right? If a hedge fund, if everybody thought that hedge fund was getting great returns, everybody would buy into that hedge fund, dilute the returns, and then all of a sudden that hedge fund wouldn't be getting great returns anymore. Um, but the reason that they can get away with that is because they're private and they take money on a discretionary basis. So again, these assets basically just are not consistently predicted for by this model, even though the p-value says that they are. Um, and the reason for that is because the p-value is assuming some stationarity in the data. It's assuming that the conditions are not changing over time. And so we talked about this a lot uh, in our violation of, of regression model assumptions and our model misspecification lectures. 
I recommend that you check those out because they, they describe like a ton of cases like this in the real world where your models can look predictive but actually not be predictive. So it's just things to watch out for. So and then and then the other thing about this model is that let's say okay well this green line is very not is not good at all but this blue line doesn't look bad right it's it's sticking pretty close to that that value that we predicted so let's zoom in on it and of course the blue line has a ton of different you know motion as well when you adjust the scale now of course this is a question of scaling and 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 in fact even this inconsistency may be fine and the question you have to ask yourself is saying okay is my strategy okay if my beta to the market is 0 0.9? Is my strategy okay if my beta to the market is 1.5? And is my strategy okay if my beta to the market is 2? Because there's definitely going to be some more motion in addition to this. You're just taking a small sample. That it could it could vary a lot more. You know, is my strategy okay if my if my is my strategy okay if my beta to the market is between 0 and 2? And you might say yes, that's fine. That doesn't affect my strategy, right? In which case, great. This is this is within your bounds. The inconsistency is not going to hurt your strategy. Go forward. But the important thing to do is just be aware of all the inconsistency. Be aware of the standard error and the parameters. Um, also, the other thing you should do is, again, check to see if the dis distribution of betas is normally distributed. And I'll talk about that a little later, but the one thing that people do is they try to put a standard error on these betas. But if these betas are not normally distributed, the standard error and the confidence interval will actually be wrong because it assumes normal distribution. So it's a, uh, you know, it, it can it, there can be a lot of problems here. Um, but at the very least, checking for these consistency plots is is very very useful. It tells you a lot about the data, and there's a lot of tools to do rolling com computations in pandas and uh, stats models. So, okay, assuming that these models weren't terrible, as we just saw, um, let's try to predict the future using these models, okay? So what we're going to do is just going to do the same computation. We're going to run the regression, get our coefficients, and then we're going to say, okay, well, we know what happened over August because we're near the end of August. So going 30 days forward, we should be able to predict what happens during September using this model. So that's what we do here. And you can see we make some predictions. Here's the stuff that we know happened with the returns of the asset. And then here's the predictions that we have for the returns of the asset. And this is based on what happened to the market and the risk-free rate um, in September. And so, of course, you can see that this is the market returns now are driving this massive spike down. Um, and uh, this, I think this is just an interesting, uh, I think this is just an interesting example because it shows like, Okay, well, this is actually, you know, your model is trying to predict the future here. And ultimately, in finance, you're always trying to predict the future. Um, and an important note that I'll leave you with for this notebook is I, I wouldn't trust any model to be able to predict the prices for a given security, for a given asset. That's incredibly monumentally difficult. And a lot of people try to do things like machine learn price curves and look for you know indicators and stuff and they'll say well this asset is going to be this price tomorrow so i should buy or something it, honestly like i just don't trust that unless you're doing something that like is just completely genius uh or taking advantage of something that's completely not known today um that that you you were able to do that and the reason that like long short equity strategies are good is because they accept the fact that they cannot predict the price accurately for any given equity uh, over the next time period. What they can do, however, is pick up on broad trends, right? So with a long short equity strategy, you're saying, I'm gonna make a prediction for a thousand assets. Well, I'm gonna make a prediction for 10,000 assets, right? And then I'm gonna use the prediction for 2,000 of them if I put a thousand long and a thousand short. And the reason that that works is because let's say that your model is a you know 51% success rate, right? And and finance is really a game of 51% success rates. If I get, took you to a casino and I said, hey, you have a 51% success rate uh, at all of these slot machines, what would you do? You wouldn't put all your money into one slot machine. You'd pick you know you you put one n one over n of your money into all of the n slot machines, right? You reduce your volatility as much as possible. And what that does is it makes you consistent money with good likelihood um, versus putting all of your money into one slot machine, which will lose all of your money with a 49% chance. So 
this is the same way with strategies, right? You're saying you don't really want to be super dependent on a single instrument and having to predict for the motion of that single instrument. But if you're predicting for a thousand instruments and you get it right 51% of the time, you're going to get that few percentage points edge where the returns in your long basket are slightly edging out the returns in your short basket. And you're going to be market neutral and you're going to be betting on that spread and you're just going to be better off. So it's just something to think about when building strategies that you want to accept the fact that you can't do some things, right? You're, you're, you want to accept what you can't do, use statistics to tell you what you can't do, and then say, okay, now that I know what I can't do, how do I like design a strategy around that? So that's kind of one of the big takeaway lectures from this. Um, but hopefully this should give you kind of a, an overview of factor modeling and, and what you can what you can use it for. Um, so the other notebook that I'm going to go to, and uh, again, I am trying to draw attention to Quantopian slash lectures. So www.quantopian.com slash lectures, or you can link to it from the um, community here. So just again, if anybody is seeing this now who was not here earlier, all of the lectures are available here. Um, you can get all the notebooks, the back tests, watch these videos, uh, and uh, find out, uh, you know, all, all of this stuff um, that we're teaching. We're also, and this is super early stage, but there's some consideration of whether, you know, we would want to make a course out of this. Um, so if anybody has interest in uh, doing a course uh, based on these lecture series, possibly with a, a certification, uh, in the end where you could get certified um, and, and I don't know exactly in what yet we'd have to figure that out but there's we're throwing that we're kind of throwing the idea back and forth um, if people are interested in that please let me know because the more interest we get in that idea the more resources we can put towards it so I'm gonna pause for two seconds just so we can edit and uh, the next thing we're going to talk about is fundamental factor models and then the last thing we'll talk about is uh, factor risk exposure. So fundamental factor models. Um, oh, sorry, I see a question here. And um, OK, great. Interest in certification, interest in the course. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Uh, yeah, we're definitely thinking about how we might do that. Um, it's something we're going to be throwing around, I would say, Stay tuned. If we do some, if we do release some information, we'll put it on the slash lectures page. So as long as you're just checking the slash lectures page every now and then, or when the lectures come out, uh, you should stay up to date on anything we do.